Today we invited Dr. Sherry Gauss, she's a pulmonologist here at OHSU, but to talk about holistic application review, uh, just to help us do that better. So thank you so much for coming, and we're really excited about the wisdom you have to share with us. Thanks for having me. Um, so yeah, so hi everybody. Um, I'm Sheree Gauss, um, and uh, like Kenny mentioned, I work in the pulmonary department. I'm also the fellowship APD for the PPCM fellowship, and seem to be the PD in November. Um, so we I thought a lot about holistic review. Um, so I have nothing to disclose today, um, but I am very excited to chat with you guys about this. It's something that's become more of a passion of mine as I've you know, travel through my journey, with my journey through medical education. So a few learning objectives today. We're going to define what holistic review is and its purpose and describe the significance of it in medical education specifically. And then we're going to identify some strategies for conducting holistic review and GME recruitment. Um, and I know um, the orthopedic residency program here has done holistic review for some time, um, but uh, I picked up some tips and tricks that hopefully you all will find helpful. So I wanted to start off this talk with a little bit of background on me and why this topic resonates with me. Um, so a little family history just to start. So these are my parents. My parents were born and raised in Jamaica. And in the 70s, 80s, you know, Jamaica was going through some more tumultuous political and economic um, strife. And so many people were leaving the island. My parents were one of them. So in 1985, they immigrated to Maryland where I was born. And I knew pretty early on that I wanted to be a physician. Um, I remember telling my pediatrician, I think at age five, that, yep, I'm going to be just like you. Um, and, you know, my parents were really excited to hear that. Um, and so because of that, uh, my parents worked really hard to make sure we were always in the best school districts. We moved around a lot when I was a kid in Maryland. Um, and as much as I appreciate what they did for me, it was often a... A tough environment to grow up in, mainly because um, I went to one of the most affluent public high schools in the state, where not only was I the only black person in the class most of the time, but I was also surrounded by children of CEOs, doctors, lawyers, um, who were groomed from a young age to know the exact steps to take to be successful, including the importance of social capital, knowing the right people, making connections, et cetera. And then I also realized that standardized tests did not come easy to me. It wasn't my forte. Um, unlike many of my peers who had the financial means to, you know, pay for multiple test uh, prep courses and tutors, um, you know, I didn't always have that. So it was a little tricky to navigate. Um, but despite that all, despite it all, I was able to attend the University of Maryland School of Medicine um, in its class of 2013 and, you know, made it up here to talk to you guys today. So. That's my story, and this is all to say that holistic review really attempts to learn the lived experience and story of an applicant to evaluate them, not by the individual parts, but as a whole. And one of the hats I wear at OHSU um, is that I am a diversity gap navigator for the OASIS program in School of Medicine. Basically, in that role, I serve as an advisee and mentor to those medical students who are underrepresented in medicine. And so, I, as I was reflecting and preparing for this talk, I realized that holistic review likely played a role in um, all of them for attending medical school as well as uh, my journey. So, the origins of holistic review really stem from the goal of creating a diverse, equitable, and inclusive workforce. And I wanted to kind of break down the DEI definition because I feel like it's a buzzword that uh, gets kind of thrown around a bit without really knowing the understanding what it stands for. So. Diversity, when we talk about diversity, we're actually speaking about fair representation of different individuals. When we talk about equity, we're actually talking about policies and structures. So fair policies and structures so that all individuals have what they need to succeed in the workforce, regardless of where they started. And then inclusion really talks about that sense of belonging, um, allowing all individuals to have a voice in the environment that they're in. So why should we care, right? Why should we care about having a diverse workforce um, as physicians? And it all makes sense when discussing health equity. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a lung doc, but I know I'm speaking, I know my audience, so I'm speaking to a room full of orthopedic surgeons today, and I want to show you guys some data um, that I found, and I 
managed to take a deep dive into healthcare utilization and surgical outcomes for patients who undergo orthopedic surgery. Um, and I was happy to find that orthopedic surgeons really are at the forefront of health disparities research. And so I'm sure this data probably isn't news to you all, but for completeness sake, let's review it. Um, so this was a retrospective review looking at data from the National Surgical Quality Improvement Program uh, from 2011 to 2019 to evaluate trends in the utilization of total hip arthroplasty between white and black patients. And they actually found that while utilization has increased over time for both groups, it has become increasingly lower for black patients. And this held true even when adjusting for um, patient um, uh, factors like age, gender, comorbidities. And so they found the same thing uh, looking at total knee arthroplasty that um, much lower utilization for, for black patients. And as far as surgical outcomes go, there was a retrospective cohort study done by Stanford and their colleagues, uh, which found that for spinal surgeries, black patients tend to have longer operative times, longer length of stays, greater risk of surgical complications like DVT and PE, specifically for uh, lumbar fusion decompressing laminectomy. And then Native Americans had a higher risk of site infections in decompression laminectomy and surgical fusions. And so, again, controlling for all factors, being black, a black person or a Native American person was an independent risk factor for worsening outcomes. And then um, probably maybe even more salient in our everyday practice, you know, we all know that uh, access in this country to healthcare is, is terrible. Um, and so uh, this data, uh, Hart and Harnett looked at social dis socioeconomic disparities and the effect on utilization of total hip arthroplasty. So on the left-hand side, um, the light areas correspond to more affluent areas. The darker areas, the purple areas, uh, correspond to uh, areas with low economic background. On the right, the, it's opposite actually, the lighter areas correspond to lower rates of total hip arthroplasty and the darker areas can, um, correspond to higher rates. So you can see that on the left-hand side, the darker areas do correspond to the lighter areas, reflecting that um, socioeconomic status reduces your um, access to total hip arthroplasty. And so why is this happening? I think, um, you know, Evaluating health disparities is very complex. There's a lot of factors, physician factors, patient factors that go into it. But one thing we do know to be true is that without a diverse medical workforce, health disparities will not improve. And so uh, we know when patients have a doctor who looks like them, they're more likely to trust their doctors, more likely to agree to certain management decisions that will progress their care. Um, in addition, physicians of color, uh, physicians from low socioeconomic backgrounds are more likely to work in medically underserved areas compared to white, more affluent physicians. I'll also provide you with a quick personal anecdote that sticks with me to this day. Um, so I was an intern on the Hemonc service and we had a black female patient on the team. Um, I got sign out that uh, there was issues with, um, you know, or not being as cooperative with nursing, kind of refusing lab draws, et cetera. So when it came time for rounds, um, when we got to her room, you know, my attending basically said, you know, um, why don't we just skip, skip over her today and I'll come back and chat with her later on my own. Um, you know, black patients tend to refuse medical care anyway. So wild statement, right? Super wild statement to, to, to hear and make. Um, and, you know, as an intern, I didn't have the guts back then to really call him out for, for kind of the deplorable statement he made. But, um, you know, I, I do think about what it would have been like if the, what the physician and patient relationship would have looked like if she had a physician who was a black female physician. And with this representation really comes the gift of cultural humility and empathetic privilege. There was a lovely piece in JAMA, you guys should check it out, um, by a physician who grew up in homeless shelters. Her name is Stephanie Zell. And um, she was pretty ashamed of it at first. She felt like she didn't really belong in medical school. She didn't have a similar background to um, her, her fellow students, but she realizes that with this um, background that she had, she really gained power that her experiences had granted her. And I'll read the statement that she, she wrote in here. It allows one to be more cognizant of the social determinants of health that patients often leave unspoken when seeking medical care. In another sense, I also feel comfort in the presence of patients with lower socioeconomic status, whereas others might feel unease and frustration because working with these patients help close the gap between my identities. And so this is really what 
the main facet of holistic review is trying to accomplish by increasing the diversity of applicant pools. Okay, I'm gonna run through this really quickly so we're, because I know we're short on time, um, but really quick wanted to go over um, how holistic review came to be. And it really stemmed from when President Johnson issued an executive order for affirmative action, really trying to rectify the effects of past discrimination that held back the advancement of minorities and women. And then in 1978, that was the first time the Supreme Court um, affirmative action was challenged by the Supreme Court. There was a student who was rejected from the medical school at University of California, UC, UCSD, um, or University of College Davis campus. And what the school had done at that time was it reserved 16 out of 100 spots for qualified minority students. And so he ruled, he challenged that um, and won. Um, ruled because it was basically a racial quota, right? And um, Supreme Court ruled that racial quotas are very unconstitutional. However, they did acknowledge that a diverse student body could provide compelling educational benefits, especially in medicine. Um, 2003 was another Supreme Court case where um, they were, two students were denied admission because they actually found out that University of Michigan was using a weighted system. So they automatically gave 20 points to students who came from underrepresented backgrounds or minority backgrounds. Um, and they realized with that 20 point boost that pretty much all uh, minority applicants were, were entering. So again, pretty unconstitutional because it, it um, alludes to a racial quota. And so uh, in 2007, the double AMC actually created the holistic framework and started in 2010, they actually started applying it. Um, holistic review to medical school applicants. Um, and then in 2013, this was another um, uh, Supreme Court case where, again, race conscious admissions were brought to the forefront. Um, they did not win this case, um, basically. Um, and, then, and then it wasn't until 2023, which you guys have probably have heard about this big case that uh, happened in June where Supreme Court actually rejects affirmative action. So, I mean, my blood pressure is super high right now uh, since this decision. And I think it leaves us questioning, what does this mean for holistic review and how is this gonna impact going forward? And I think overall, it just means that we have to lean into it even more and be really thoughtful about how we do it. Um, so really quick, the double AMC has a um, definition that I really like um, of holistic review. And it's basically a flexible individualized way of assessing an applicant's capabilities by which balanced consideration is given between experiences, attributes, competencies, and metrics, and when considered in combination, how the individual might contribute to the value, uh, contribute value to the institution's mission. So it really is focused on four core principles. There's four core principles of holistic review. The selection criteria must be broad and it has to be linked to the institutional program missions and goals. And it is based on the concept that your program cannot be excellent without diversity. It focuses on the balance between, again, like I mentioned, experiences, attributes, and metrics. And I think a lot of people think holistic review ignores metrics, and it certainly does not. It just weights it as heavily as your experiences and attributes. And so it um, uses this to really create a diverse uh, applicant pool. Um, must be equitable um, across the candidate pool. So everyone gets equal opportunity. And then it should really be data driven. So it should be supported by data that shows that certain experiences, attributes and metrics for your program are linked to the success of a trainee in your program. Core principle number three. So the recruitment uh, members must give individualized consideration to each applicant. So I think we go, we run into the um, crux of comparing applicants and you really shouldn't do that when you're doing holistic review. You should really be focusing on that individual applicant. And then it weighs and balance the criteria of the applicant to um, show how they might be able to contribute to your specific learning environment and professional healthcare practice. Race, ethnicity, and gender may be considered when it is in line with the mission related interests and goals. So, for example, if your mission statement states that you want to um, have an applicant pool or a residency class that is, um, resembles the diverse population of the patients that you care for, then you can certainly take race into consideration as one of these factors. And again, it's really considered amongst a broader mix, which can include personal attributes, demographics, et cetera. So really holistics review is a push from 
changing from focusing primarily on metrics to really mission-driven admissions, um, focusing on picking applicants that will really push forward your mission as an institution. So this is an example um, of an EAM model. So I used to be an APD at the OHSU Internal Medicine Hillsborough program. Um, and we started uh, from, the, from the break doing holistic review. And so we were really focusing on residents who wanted to serve being underserved communities. Um, and Hillsborough has a big Latinx population. So um, we really were looking for applicants who could serve those patients. Maybe um, they were fluent in Spanish or um, had a Latinx background. So this was an example of an applicant who would serve that purpose um, for our mission. They grew up in Hillsboro. Um, they are have a passion for working with underserved communities. They are Latinx, et cetera. So I don't think I can say this enough. A successful historic review is not measured by meeting a set quota of diverse students. So it's really working to achieve a level of diversity that is associated with reduced discrimination and an increased sense of inclusion. It serves to promote mm -hmm. equity by eliminating intergenerational inequality and to create a really culturally prepared healthcare workforce who has the ability to serve underserved communities. And something to remember is that should, this should just not occur in the screening process, it really should occur in the screening, interview, and selection, the ranking process as well. Um, when talking a lot about race, I feel like it's the most salient, um, uh, low-hanging fruit, but really diversity um, can encompass a lot of different things. And I encounter this often with uh, the students I work with as a diversity navigator. Um, so holistic review really prevents any one of these things from being the deciding factor for interviewing and selecting candidates. <clears throat> Socioeconomic status is another challenge that um, comes up a lot for my students. And I just wanted to bring this to the forefront. This article was just published in May. I don't know if you saw it, but it basically links the likelihood of medical school acceptance with childhood income. And um, those who came from a low socioeconomic background were less likely to get into medical school. And I, I think it, it makes sense. Um, you know, they don't might not have the means to pay for MCAT prep. They might not have the means to spend time shadowing physicians in hospitals because they're the primary breadwinner in their family and they need to make money. Um, so just something to, to keep in mind there. Um, as I alluded to before, um, you know, uh, this decision really does uh, stress a lot of us medical educators out. Um, and I often kind of wonder how we can really separate race um, from admissions because of this concept of intersectionality. I think it's challenging to separate race. Um, and intersectionality really means that each element of who you are is linked to other parts of yourself. For example, um, I'm a black woman, but that is very distinct from being a black person and just being a woman. I have a specific individual experience because I am a black woman. Um, and so I do think it's gonna be tricky to see how people um, will actually start separating race, or even if you can um, do that in the holistic review process. Um, there are some states where race conscious admissions are technically banned. Uh, states like California, Washington um, have had this for years. Um, and so they've had to be very uh, creative at uh, increasing their diversity in their applicant pool. And so this article just showed that when the ban was initially instituted, um, diversity went down. You know, not a big surprise. And it also deterred um, uh, underrepresented minority patients from applying as well. Um, we're all well aware, not going to belabor the point, of the gender, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic gaps that continue to persist in medicine and have become wider in some cases. Um, and so one of the major contributions to this is what I what the term the leaky pipeline. And when I say pipeline, I'm referring to the path individuals take from childhood to achieving their career goals. The leaky pipeline is when various barriers occur at different points in the journey for people who are underrepresented. And then these barriers prevent them from being successful. And it's most prevalent in the STEM careers, the science, tech, engineer, and math careers. And the pipeline starts very early for those underrepresented in, man in medicine. In fact, it actually starts as back, far back as preschool um, due to, mainly due to this achievement gap, which basically talks about the disparity in academic and standardized test performance that exists between white students and underrepresented minority students. And it worsens as students progress throughout the educational system, mainly due to, uh, driven by the lack of resources. 
standardized tests riddled with bias, riddled with bias, um, mainly because a lot of the, the questions have a cultural bias uh, that's weighted toward the majority of the population in the United States. It's driven by American phrases, images, and references, which so places students who aren't born here or maybe not didn't grow up in an American household at a disadvantage. And it really requires the development of a test-taking skill, which again, where do you learn that? In elementary school. Um, and so that disproportionately affects uh, students who come from a lower economic background. And because of this bias, we have seen that underrepresented minorities and those who come from a lower socioeconomic background tend to score lower on step one and step two. And so we shouldn't really be looking at this as um, a measure of um, uh, whether we should be inviting people to interview. And I will say there's no data that shows that step scores correlate with how successful of a doctor you're gonna be. Um, and you can imagine there are a lot of psychological consequences that widen this, these grades and test score discrepancy even more. Underrepresented minorities have a high level of stereotype threat and imposter syndrome. Stereotype threat meaning that an individual's performance will be impacted by a negative stereotype. And so this can uh, be a, um, a uh, domino effect and can worsen their academic performance. Um, and they've done a lot, of, a lot of studies on this as well. And so it's really an uphill climb for underrepresented minorities in a privileged system. Uh, we talked about all of the uh, significance of having resources um, in addition to facing systemic barriers like a hostile learning environment with a lack of social support, lack of mentorship. Um, and so again, holistic review is one of those processes that can be used to help with some of the leaks in the pipeline to provide access to those who have otherwise not made it through the system otherwise. Okay, so we talked about that holistic review was created to create uh, diversity. So a um, couple studies that have been done that show that it's definitely the case. Um, this looked at medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, and public health, I believe. Um, and after they instituted holistic review me uh, methods, 81% had an increase in the diverse applicant pool compared to when they didn't use holistic review. Um, they also found that there were a lot of positive outcomes um, from using holistic review among students. Most students said that it promoted a collaborative atmosphere, more openness, people were, had more of a community engagement. University leaders said that the learning environment improved and um, they found that it was relatively feasible to do, um, even though in regards to buy-in from uh, alumni and having dedicated time, which I think is one of the biggest challenges of holistic review that I'll chat about in a little bit. Looking at medical schools alone, this study was done at Oakland University School of Medicine, and the data set was a group of applicants who they selected using holistic review, and then a test group who would have been selected using merit-based selection criteria. And you can see that the percentages of everything, females, underrepresented, first-generation students, um, all improved after holistic review was used. Um, so that was the UME data. There's very limited uh, data in the GME world, I should say, um, but this was done at an IM residency at UT uh, Health in Austin, uh, Houston, and they looked at pre-intervention, which was 2015-2016, of holistic review to post-intervention, which was 2017-2018, and the percentage of underrepresented applicants did go up. So, um, this was a study, so I mentioned I'm a pulmonary care doc and I'm involved in the leadership, so we take holistic review really seriously, and this is why. So this study was published in 2020, and as you can see, if you look at applicants versus fellows, um, there's been a big drop off, particularly with underrepresented minorities. So in the PCCM world, we are not good at um, creating a diverse um, pool of PCCM attendings and faculty. And so um, this is something that we are strongly working on in general. Okay, so now I wanted to dive into some strategies that can be used to ensure a successful holistic review. We've used some and slash all of these at some point. We are constantly uh, reiterating our, our strategies. But the first thing, because this is a mission-based admissions process, you need to make sure your mission statement is clear to everybody from um, trainees to the level of uh, division chairs. And everyone on the recruitment committee should understand the institu institution mission as well. And so you really need to have buy-in from the highest level of leadership to do this. And so I would say really consider how well 
your app, the applicant that is applying to your program represents your mission. Just because they might be a, they're a stellar applicant, you know, and they've, they're super accomplished, they might not necessarily be a stellar applicant in your program. Um, and so it's really about making sure that the kind of program you offer can satisfy and support the kind of training you are recruiting. One thing that we used this year was mission based filters in ERAS, where we used, um, uh, we picked out keywords, for example, of communication was something that we valued. Um, we searched in, used ERAS to search in the letters of recommendation where um, communication, strong communication skills was linked. Or if you're looking for um, applicants who might have been in medicine already, like in PCCM, typically if you um, were a hospitalist or an ICU hospitalist for a year, that really does help with how you perform in fellowship. So we search for those types of things as well. And I think that definitely cut down on the amount of applicants that we got, um, or sorry, amount of applications that we had to review. So filters can be tricky. You have to use them in a particular way. You don't wanna screen out too much, but I think it does help with the burden of reviewing applications if you use it well. Um, you need to make sure that your recruitment team is diverse. We all come with different perspective, different biases. Um, you know, it wouldn't be great if my recruitment team had a bunch of clinical educators. I always make sure we have physician scientists, clinical leaders, those types of people as well. Um, and then one thing we used this year was a DEI subcommittee. So we had faculty who were particularly interested in this effort to only review um, a group. They were the only ones selected to review um, underrepresented uh, applicants in medicine. And so with that, our numbers actually increased from 15% to 27% this year, as far as um, applicants that we invited to interview. It's important to normalize implicit bias. We all have it. Um, and I think reviewers should really treat bias like a vital sign. Know that it's gonna be there. It's gonna come up. Whenever you're reviewing an application, ask yourself, why am I having this immediate opinion of this applicant? And it should never really be a quick yes or a quick no. You're really trying to evaluate the applicant through application through a different lens based on their own experiences and attributes. And so things that can help with this, faculty development I think is a big here. Um, there's an unconscious bias training that OHSU offers. Um, I also think the implicit associations test is a cool test to take if you've never done it before. It's, it's um, online by Harvard. Um, it just kind of brings these things to the forefront so that you're aware of it. And it's impossible to eliminate all bias, but at least being aware of it is the first thing, uh, first step. We have been, we've blinded test scores to our interviewers. So um, as fellowship leadership, we know what they got on their step one and step two, but we blind all our reviewers and our um, interviewers to that to reduce bias. Um, lots of bias in letters of rec, which is super challenging. Um, you know, men are tended to uh, be described as like quick learners and really smart, intelligent versus women are tended to be described as more compassionate, nurturing, not really speaking to their clinical skills. So be aware of that. Um, there's also uh, letters of rec tend to be shorter and use less favorable words for um, uh, applicants who are international medical grads or underrepresented minorities. So another thing to keep an eye out of. And I think um, it's important to think of where the, the uh, letter of rec is coming from. So smaller programs, you know, they don't have as much experience writing letters and using those buzzwords that we look for. So those are things we, we keep in mind as well. And I think it helps to review batches of applicants from the same program at one time, um, because some programs might tend to word letters more strongly than others. So that can help to reduce bias in this way. Um, these are some common rating errors. I won't go through all of them, but um, the first impression rating errors, I think is a big one. You know, if you, you immediately feel connected to the person you're interviewing, if they have a similar background to you. And so that can kind of bias you in a positive way. But again, it is a bias, so try to be aware of that. Um, and then again, the contrast effect is another thing that I see people fall victim to is really comparing um, applicants. So if you start, if you have like 10 people you're gonna interview that day, um, towards the end, I've noticed that the scores have been a little bit lower because you're a little tired at the end of the day. Um, you might not be as engaged. Um, so just something to be aware of um, as well. Make sure you give your interviewers breaks, lots of breaks in between. Using a standardized rubric can also help. We've done this some, some years and some years we haven't. Um, we're still trying to finalize this year of 
um, what a perfect standardized rubric or what we want our rubric to be. Um, but uh, this can be something that's helpful. And again, your, you can base your rubric on what your mission, what the mission you want to accomplish is for your institution. And then we've used these scores to make a prelim rank list um, amongst the leadership. And then during your rank meeting, you can kind of discuss, take a deeper dive and people that are scores might be a little similar, move uh, uh, applicants up and down, that kind of thing. Standardized interviews, I think, are very helpful, specifically using behavioral based interview questions that again hone in on attributes you value in your program. So for us, for PCCM, um, we have a lot of non clinical time towards the end of their fellowship. And so we expect them to be doing some type of scholarly project, scholarly work. And so we really we ask a question about um, uh, grit in, in doing scholarly work with uh, our interviewers. So I find this really helpful. You can find out a lot of good information. Um, and so the one thing to note is that there's not really data that shows that behavioral based interview questions reflect future clinical performance, although I do think it does help create a good match between the applicant and your institution goals. And then the last strategy really is to make sure you always review and reflect um, on your holistic review process. It should always take an evidence based approach. Gather your data um, from each year and at the end of recruitment season, see if you've shifted the needle um, when it comes to diversity. And then also asking yourselves if your trainees historically have aligned with your mission as an institution. There's a lot of challenges with holistic review, mainly because it takes a lot of time, a lot of time, a lot of thought. Um, and so it just requires a lot of people, a lot of hands on deck. And I think doing a lot of prep work ahead of time has really helped us as far as conducting the review. Um, the other thing too, to keep in mind, it cannot be performed in a vacuum, meaning that um, it's it's an influenced by kind of the current social uh, social political climate, um, which informs healthcare needs at the time. So, I think it, it's important to remember that the way you do holistic review will always change depending on you know what health equities exist um, uh, in the patient population. And then I think the other thing is that holistic review advances equality but not equity, meaning you know it allows everyone. To stand on boxes of similar height, um, but as you've seen, you know, we're not the, the medical workforce is has the diversity hasn't really changed over the last few decades. Um, and so it hasn't um, resulted in increasing the box of those who are who are at the height of the box of those who are underrepresented. Um, so um, this probably is also not news to you all. <laughs> But I found this um, this uh, survey data that was published in 2018. You know, I feel like I think there's been a lot of great efforts from the the data that I reviewed in the orthopedic residency as far as uh, recruiting females, recruiting underrepresented minorities. But the attrition rate for females and underrepresented minorities in orthopedic surgery is still not great. And so I think that's the reason why we we've seen these demographics. So, you know, there, there's some things we still need to do better in that way. Um, and this is not, you know, of course, not particular to orthopedic surgery. This is like across all specialties in medicine. And so while holistic review is a fantastic tool to increase diversity and should be used in the admissions process, it's obviously not enough. Um, I think working on outreach to underrepresented in medicine candidates is really important, especially in light of the recent Supreme Court decision, you know, maybe focusing on um, applicants um, who uh, come from HBCUs, for example, international medical grads, uh, forming some type of like outreach program, I think would be would be really important. Um, and I think faculty retention is big. So you once you recruit these people, how are you going to support them? How are you going to make sure that they're psychologically safe? Um, so, making sure that you have programs in place to build community, I think, is also really important. And mentorship is a big one as well. And so, just want to finish by saying that, you know, we are the gatekeepers as, as medical educators um, of the medical profession. You know, we dictate who's going to take care of us when we're old, and who's going to take care of our, our kids and the rest of our family. And so, I think it's really important to be thoughtful and take the time to um, try to do holistic review well. And so I have a couple of thank yous. Um, Anna Brady is the current PD of PCCM and um, we worked very closely together trying to revamp our holistic review.
process. Um, Bart Moulton used to be the, the program director of PCCM, and he's also, um, he was the first one who actually suggested that we blind test scores. Um, you know, it, was, it took a little bit to change culture, but we were able to do it. So I'm really thankful to Bart, really thankful for to my diversity navigators and all the trainees. I have noticed that the trainees in the last few years are super brave. They're not afraid to speak out um, when they see injustices and they really do inspire me. So thankful for them. And then uh, Paulette Granberry Russell, uh, really is the president of the National Association of Diversity Officers in Higher Education. And so she helped me um, kind of come up with the, the background um, and um, provide me information with the history of holistic review. So that is all I have. Ooh, and I finished at 8 p.m., 8 a.m. <laughs> so happy to take any questions you guys might have. Yeah, so like we've, we've talked about this a little bit in OASIS meetings too. Um, I think, so it doesn't affect res GME, at least right now. So we haven't changed anything. We've done everything exactly the same. Um, but, you know, I always think about the pipeline and how it's going to affect our medical students coming in. Um, and so I think we'll have to think of substitutes um, for race since we, you know, at the medical school level, you have to do race neutral admissions currently, meaning, um, I think sometimes looking at like zip code socioeconomic status can account for that. Um, and uh, students are allowed to divulge, like, so if uh, their race has made a huge impact as far as their experiences, um, for example, if they write their personal statement about discrimination or something like that, you can use that. So they can divulge things, you just can't do it on the back end. So I've thought about this and I've thought about, you know, chatting with med students and, and um, you know, maybe giving them some guidance as far as how to like, you know, present their application. That's another thing that I've been thinking about. Oh, yes. Oh, Dr. Gundel, go for it. Hey, can you get, can you all hear me? Yes, kind of. I'm not sure. I can hear you. Oh, oh. <laughs> I don't know if the room can hear you. Okay. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much. It's such an amazing, amazing, amazing talk and very important topic. Could you remind us how how many fellows do you have a year? Yeah, so we're actually really similar to you all as, as far as size. We do we have four fellows a year. Hopefully, soon to be five, depending on how things go. But we're a pretty small program. And 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 as like a big believer that that structure helps form function. Uh, do you mind if I ask like how much ad, um, administrative FTE or educational FTE you get for for your current role, or how much the fellowship has overall? Yeah, so as, um, and this has changed in the last few years, so as APD, we get 0.14, and um, our core faculty, our core faculty get 0.1, but I will say this used to not be the case. Usually, you didn't get any FTE for, for uh, medical education, so it's not very much, but it's something. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, I do. I do think it's a a little bit of a barrier to holistic review. Or, orthopedics is now in the minority in that our core faculty get no FTE, uh, even with the recent changes. And our APD gets 0.1, and and I have 0.2. Um, and and it is a little bit of a barrier. Did you find you know some advantages in having core faculty having that FTE? Does like do you think that that helps holistic review? work better or I'd be curious your thoughts yeah, on hundred percent hundred percent so with they get like their FT contract and we specifically list you will be involved in recruitment you will be involved in rank meetings um I think you know they were already doing this work bless them without FTE but now that it's written down I do think um you know they're getting they're getting financially supported for the work that they've already been doing and I, I do think that it encourages um, other faculty who um, might not have thought about being core faculty to join and, and help us. So yeah, I, if you can lobby for that from the top down, I think that would be really helpful. Yeah, that's really great. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And you know, we, we've been doing holistic review actually with no filters. So even the year we had a thousand applications, we read all of them. Um, so I was, I was kind of surprised that you all are using filters. It sounds like in a very intentional way, but how many applications are you all reviewing? Um, you know, uh, yeah, so after you do filters. Sure. So historically it's around 400. We got 
370 this year. And I think it sounds like across the medicine subspecialties, the numbers went down a little bit because ERAS changed where they have to only list the mo their most important meaningful experiences. So I think it kind of, it, the application process is probably a little bit more tedious for the applicant. So I think that's why the numbers across the board have gone down. So that helped us a little bit. Um, I, as far as reviewing each of our faculty review anywhere between 50 to 60, we last year, um, the program director and myself reviewed all of them. And actually this year, she tried to review all of them and didn't get through all of them and, and kind of leaned on our core faculty a lot for that. Um, so, and I'm curious, do you all, like as the program director, do you review all the applications yourself or? No, thankfully our wonderful faculty volunteers chip in and review a substantial number. Um, yeah. They all go through two faculty members uh, and if I'm one of them, then somebody else is the other one. And that gets it down to a more manageable group for final review. And then, um, and, and then we make decisions on interviewing um, and our, um, our DEI group has been involved in those final decisions um, as well. Um, and so that's kind of our normal process, but we, we, you know, we have a great group of faculty who, who helped me review them in the end. I feel like I, re, I, you know, I reviewed 700 applications last year. Like I see them in the end, but, but we have a great faculty support to, to get the job done early on. Yeah. That's great. It's really great. And having protected time, like working somehow with your schedule to see if maybe you can have some protected time to like actually review those applications is helpful, but I know it's tricky with surgeon schedule. It's tough. Yes. So if I gave you a whole year to improve the education of your position, it would be a better host for you next year. Mm -hmm. Ooh, great. And mostly just because as we lean into holistic review, I guess I you know, the worries that we're leaning in the unconscious bias that we all have. Yeah. So if I took a year to work on my unconscious bias, what would you? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think from the beginning, just so we're, we have been very much um, intentional about faculty development in this. And so we didn't get a chance to do this this year, but I really wanted to do a workshop for our recruitment committee on unconscious bias. And um, there's been some great work at Ohio State and some other um, institutions where it seems they have a lot of resources. And so definitely would do something like that, like some type of like faculty development. And I think it's something that we just have to always be thinking about and reiterating. Um, you know, I don't think like, I've, even though I mentioned, you know, OHSU has an unconscious bias training here, which there it's really good, but I don't think that's enough. Like, I think it needs to be something that's done on a repeated kind of schedule um, so that people are constantly thinking about it. Um, so yeah, I think I would, I would, you know, try to come up with, create some type of workshop for our, our recruitment um, committees talking about implicit bias and cultural humility and, and all that stuff. Mm, yeah, I mean, I think those organizations are great because mentorship can come out of that. And I, I mean, personally for myself, like in journey, like throughout my journey, I just, it meant a lot when um, someone who came from a similar background at me, from me, like reached out and like really seemed invested in my success. And so I think, um, yeah, those professional societies are great for that as far as like, coming up with a mentor team and sponsors and things like that. Yeah, so I've seen it done both ways. Um, what we found, so we did it the first way initially where every um, every interviewer asked the, the applicant the same question and then the interviewers kind of gave us in our post survey feedback that this is like, we don't wanna do this. Like we're answering the same question over and over. It seems like not genuine. So this year we actually, the last two years, we actually have a set of questions that, um, for example, like set A could be focusing on clinical excellence, set B could be focusing on grit, for example, and there's a few questions in each that faculty can choose from, and that interviewer can only ask questions from that set, and that interviewer gets all four sets asked. So that's kind of how we've, we've done it the last couple of years, and I think that's worked a little bit better. And I think what can be helpful there is using a rubric for their answers. So you can kind of like reduce bias that way, and then when you're 
in your, and I, I mean, and I do think it should still, like interviewers should still be like a conversation, right? You don't want it to be super regimented, but I think using a rubric, focusing on those um, attribute questions, behavioral based questions can help reduce a little bias there. Obviously, people who are in like race and mm -hmm. a lot of other people, more people sex that are in the majority. Right. Um, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I know uh, I don't know the community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think um, being invested in like all the conversations. So I'm really thankful because Anna Brady, who's a current PD, um, like, clearly this is like something that's super important to her and she's always the one trying to like push things forward. So I feel like it's not just a burden on me. Um, so I think, you know, it's like allyship and, and, um, making sure that. Like, you all are all ma also making moves as much as people that are coming from underrepresented backgrounds are making moves. Um, so, you know, and I, I think, um, yeah. I think it's more like um, support and also like checking in with your faculty that are underrepresented, making sure that, you know, they don't feel like the pressure to uh, sign up for all these things and always have to be uh, take on the burden for them, I think is important as well. It's a good question. Any other questions? Okay, cool. Well, thanks everybody. Appreciate it.